In a world where 99% of people are desperately trying to fit in, the 1% understand that success is found when you stand out from the crowd. I'm Jack Henderson, and this is the Flamingo Sundays podcast. If you're looking for the 99%, you're in the wrong place. Aaron Carrasco is the co-founder of successful paint and sip creative experience, Pino and Picasso. From starting only five years ago in his hometown of Penrith, Pino and Picasso now boasts an impressive 85 franchisees across Australia and New Zealand. From the business idea originating on a boozy Saturday night out, only six weeks later was Pino and Picasso born. And from that day five years ago, there's been an extreme amount of personal and business growth that we're going to unpack. Aaron Carrasco, Picasso once said, only put off until tomorrow what you are willing to die having left undone. What comes to mind when you hear that quote? I think it works really well with potentially the quote that I'm going to say um, after that. And it's been something that uh, has been always running through my mind where the, the, this world's filled with woulda, coulda, shouldas. And that kind of resonates completely with that. And it's so much easier to just let tasks build up and, and, and just put it in that too hard basket for something later um, where as time goes on, you, you do see the people that would just bite down a little bit harder on their mouth guard and do the horrible work to, to really see it out. Mm. And and you you obviously answer that question now with a lot of background to, to, to give you the context to answer it like that. Um, how would have teenage Darren answered that question? I wouldn't say many years ago, but <laughs> some years ago. Yeah, it would be really interesting, to be fair, where I think when you're at school, you always, you don't look anything further than tomorrow. Mm. Um, so where everything was just, laid out for you so for it to not for you to not do something that day there was no consequences for it whereas today it's so much more uh, significant to not live by that i resonate with that absolutely there's a lot more people relying on you correct so you know from from the way you would have answered that question however many years ago it was to the way you answered it now there's obviously a lot of water under the bridge and a lot of context that's come to it um what did your upbringing and, and childhood look like we, we obviously grew up in a similar area out in, in western sydney um h- how did how did those early years form you know the, the person you are right now yeah i i, I am a, the eldest child of two migrant parents who migrated to australia in the early 80s one's chilean one's south african and they worked really hard to give us a, an amazing life they moved out to uh, the western suburbs glenmore park um and built a house and and put us through worked really hard to put us through some good schooling we lived on an amazing street full of um, great kids that it was literally the the stereotypical Australian dream where yeah. you came home when the street lights were on. You understood where people were by where their bikes were. <laughs> like everything that's now romanticized that you can't get back those times, we lived that. So in terms of an upbringing, we, we had an amazing upbringing where we were, but also learnt the value of hard work mm. really, really quickly. Um, like I said, my parents put me through quite a good school and it didn't come easy for them at all. So I think they were always kind of wanting to create a better life for their children. And when we kind of just wanted to decide where we were going in the next part of our lives after school, it was always you become a professional, a working professional, whether that's a nurse, whether that's a teacher, whether that's just something of of high esteem within the community. So I guess that started where we were and I, I started podiatry when I left school because I thought that was a smart thing to do and it, and it, and it is a great profession. Mm. Um, but four years down the track, I, I really fell out of love with that. So in summary, an amazing childhood. I always look back so fondly and I thought it was just the norm at the time. And the older I get, I realize it is, it, it's a one in a million type experience. You often find that when, when people migrate to Australia, um, the the thing that they emphasize onto their children, parents, is is education. So making sure that you you often have an education that they weren't able to have. Um, did, did, were you serious about your education and, and, you know, going to school and getting good grades and, um, you know, obviously going to university? Yeah, I our school was great because uh, we were very particularly sporty, but it, it wasn't a cool thing to be mediocre. Mm. Um, 
even though I had some amazing friends, we all wanted to compete against each other. And I think that competition really allowed us to be a lot more studious, um, a lot more present. We Not going to school wasn't a fun thing to do, um, especially because there was ramifications that afternoon that you couldn't go out on the street or um, just go out and play. So I, I really enjoyed school. I, I know a lot of people didn't like school, but I loved it. Mm. I look back so fondly about school. I, I met my wife in school. Um, yeah, I, I can't, you know, say anything greater about school and my experience. What, what, what did you like about school? Was it the, the social aspect of school or, or was it the serious guy to school and the education I think it was and a combination of all like you got to play sport you got to you got to see your friends you got to do everything and and for kids that are in school now it's just amazing to think you know you don't have to do anything to see your best mates mm. you just got to show up um school manufactures that for you so it's absolutely crazy that people don't like going to school because once they finish year 12 you have to work so much harder to see your best friends after that so yeah i i i think i realized that at the time it was as good as it gets um, which, yeah, I'm really grateful that I, I actually embraced it at the time. And it's funny, you know, that when, I, when I asked you the question around how would you have answered that question when you were a teenager and you said, well, often you just live day to day. You don't necessarily have to think about next week or the week after or ramifications if you, you know, make a certain decision. Um, as you graduated from, from school and, and, and you studied in, in university? Yeah, I went to, went to WSU, as it's called now, to study podiatry, which... Uh, if you're not familiar, it's the the study of feet. <laughs> and the uh, the the question I asked is that when it started to change, to think, well, now I'm getting into real life. I do have ramifications if I don't study for this exam, or I don't, you know, show up. No, nah, um, it was still fly by night. Like, <laughs> really, I think I think I'd be lying if 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 you you said well once university kicked around, like you you went into gear, like it it. it wasn't like that for me and I'm sure it's not like that for a really large amount of people that go to university. University is incredible that you get, you know, half the year off and realistically you need to work really hard for maybe a month per semester. So you've got to work hard for two months of the year and you've got to kind of 10 months to cruise at 21 and, and all your kids, are, I mean, sorry, all your friends are doing exactly the same thing. All kids. All, all kids, yeah. <laughs> general children. Um, it's the best ever. Yeah. yeah. And, and, the four years, you, you obviously, it was at four years of study and then into... Into the practice. Career. And yeah. it was at the, the last semester of the last year where I, I really had this kind of realisation that I hated it. I, in these medical type degrees, you are required to go to a practice and spend a lot of time there. And it's like teachers, you go and practice, what they call prax. And I, throughout my four years prior to that, any time I had to go and practice, a sinking feeling would come on a Sunday night thinking, what excuse can I have to get out of this? And so I had so many doctor's uh, notes saying I ran into a pole the night before <laughs> and had this horrible con concussion or had a gastro bug or whatever to just get, I guess, passed off without having to do it. Um, and I thought, if I'm doing that now, like what luck do I have at 28, 35, mm. whatever it may be? Um, and then I guess I can see and, and we had a lot of all our friends were starting to kind of come out of their university degrees and that was them and that's you know what they they choose to do and i mean as we go on now and i'm 30 i can see full well while the term midlife crisis exists um and thankfully um i was able to recognize that at a time and didn't go too far into the profession and then leave and completely start again when there was a lot on the table how did you make the decision when you finished year 12 to then go into uni that you wanted to get into that profession in the first place? I worked at Rebel Sport in the footwear department and anyone that worked in Rebel Sport knew that the, the rock stars came from footwear. So, <laughs> um, And we, we worked closely with podiatrists and they always seemed to have a really good life. Um, they made good money. They they were kind of... Uh, they, yeah, like they made good money and, and they weren't particularly stressed. Um, and there was options to then go and build your own businesses and, and that would, again, obviously make um that financial element even better so that was i guess the the lure um obviously sports biomechanics and everything like that was always i guess enticing towards me but yeah i just realized that uh, if you if there is a glamorous part to any work um you're probably only dealing with it you know five percent of the time exactly and and it sounds like the financial driver was the big thing right you were exposed to 
podiatrist at, at Rebel or that, that sector of the market. It seems like they made good money. And, Correct. And that's what yeah. And, and you could make good money relatively quickly out of university. Right. So four years into the into the journey and you realize, well, I haven't even started really making the money yet and I, and I don't like it. Um, how did that transition go from, okay, now I'm not going to be a professional. I'm going to go into something else. Yeah. And how did the conversation go with your parents? Yeah, well? great, great <laughs> question. Um, it, the worst thing was my sister had just finished her nursing degree and she's a year younger than me. Um, so I was still kind of at uni. She was about to go in and make, you know, good money. And she was that professional that my parents wanted. They wanted that um, beautiful degree on their wall. And um, it's, you know, it's it's job job complete for them after that um, in terms of education. Uh, in terms of telling my parents, they were incredibly, really, really, really supportive. Um, I said to them, look, I've seen what you guys have gone through as migrants in Australia and Australia is just a land of opportunity. So if I didn't have a crack, I think I'd always be just having that perennial itch. Mm. So I feel like now's the right time where I potentially don't know where I'm going. Um, but also there's risk versus reward. There was very limited risk. Um, I was living with my parents, had such little living in, like expenses. So yeah, they, they were, they were really cool about it. And, you know, whether Pino was a manifestation or something just happened or, you know, you put yourself in a position where something could have popped up, who knows? Like, I, I think about it all the time. I speak to James about it all the time. Um, it's well documented that we came from a, a life of not creatives. So, yeah, it's it's a very, I always think back and laugh a lot. Were your parents entrepreneurial or were they professionals? My mum ran. My mum runs a, a franchise herself in the education space, um, and she, and that's been, uh, I guess, the great supporter of our family. Um, would I say she's entrepreneurial? Not particularly. I wouldn't say my dad is. Right. Um, it, they just kind of worked a business to to make uh, ends meet, really. Yeah. Um, but not necessarily trying to. Yeah. I, no. Yeah. Okay. So they work inside of someone else's business, essentially. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So, at the end of the four-year study, did you know that you wanted to start a company, or no? I had no idea. You just didn't I'm, want to be in podiatry. Correct. Yeah. Right. Correct. So, was there a a period there where you, you you went on a bit of a sabbatical, or when I did something else to try and gather thoughts and work out what you wanted to do? Uh, I think we were like I'm. I'm always curious, and I've loved how, uh, regardless of what business I've worked in as a as a kid, I've loved how it worked how you acquire a customer, how you get the stock to move, how everything works, how you see that customer through, how the transaction happens, I guess the behind the scenes. Um, I've been always curious as to how things work. So mm. whether it was intentional at that point in time to start companies or anything like that, I wouldn't say I was that you know, um, kid with no university qualifications dropout that was just like, give me something and give me everything. Um, I was prepared to, you know, bide a little bit of time, potentially go work full time somewhere. Um, I, I always say like, if you can kind of sit in the question a little bit longer, it, it really does kind of appear mm. at times. You just got to be prepared for something to come. So, so how long did you sit in that, in that question before? I think maybe Pino a year and a bit. And then we started our first business, which was a rugby league business, which was kind of allowing, um, kids that weren't as talented as you're from the West. So you understand what a stronghold rugby league is. Um, kids that weren't as talented to get picked up by Penrith or Parramatta or whoever it may be the opportunity to train like them. So eventually when puberty and growth and um, desire kind of kick in at 16, 17, 18, they had the skill set to match. Mm. Um, we just found too much of a disparity. So that was our first in 2015 or so. Um, yeah. And h how did that business? It was good. It was, it was kind of like shaking up an industry that hadn't changed in forever. Um, rugby league is a really interesting sport that the it's probably the only sport in the world that the better you get at it the less you pay if, mm. if you think about that that's crazy um, when you think about tennis soccer like whatever sport you are the better your child becomes the more outlay the parents have to come up with um, which does make it a little bit funny in the way that opportunities kind of go um, astray and, and yeah it, it's just a it's a funny sport, rugby league. So it did go, it did do really well. We did find a market for it, but at the same time, it was, um, it was also a, an uphill struggle all the time. And, and, and did that business come about from your passion for Yeah. And I had two partners that also saw the same thing, weren't, you know, were 
absolute lovers at 13, 14, 15, but didn't have, I guess, the skill set to, or sorry, the physical uh, attributes to match it with kids that were a lot bigger and a lot faster. So once, uh, I guess, you guys got to a stage where that business wasn't feasible or you wanted to move on to something else, what, what did that transition then look like onto the next business? So James and I went to school um, together and, and James is in the UK at the moment starting Pino UK, but we went to school together and, and every month or so after school, especially as we started to get into our you know 20s, we'd always talk about businesses, companies doing something together. Um, so it was never, this is what it is. Mm. Um, it was, would you be open to something in the future at some capacity? So we always just kind of had a, a rolling idea that, you know, one day we might work together. So you're right, as that first business was becoming somewhat unfeasible and um, it really just struck us out of nowhere. Um, the story goes that my now wife and our actual, her best friend, which is actually that uh, before she went on maternity leave, she, she ran our franchising side of things. Um, they just randomly went to one in the city one night and then they picked me up from the pub. James was in <laughs> Vietnam. He, he just came off a break up and was finding himself yeah um and they were so happy when they picked me up and i looked in the back and there was two two paintings and i'm like what what is this and they like, we had a great night um it was so much fun we can't believe how quick time went and that was i guess the genesis of the, the creation of pinot so this was another another company where yep. they went and, and and had the a similar experience correct. or it was a similar format yep. to, to pinot and Picasso. Yep. correct yep. Six weeks later, we opened. Six weeks later, we opened Pinot in Penrith. Um, so it all happened really quickly. I texted James and I said, uh, "Listen, mate, I think this might be the one." Um, and that text exchange runs up the walls of our head office, which is always pretty cool so to kind good. of see where we did come from. So, yeah, it it it's always something that didn't we didn't expect. If they decided that night, uh, let's go to the movies instead, would we be in this position? Who knows? Very hard to say. That's so funny, isn't it? It's just crazy. Sliding doors, you know, serendipity, whatever it may be, the butterfly effect. Um, there's so many fate, whichever, whatever buzzword you want to say, it was all of them. So obviously from from having the idea, and this also then goes back to, to the quote I asked at the start, having an idea and then actually implementing that idea yep. and then bringing it to life within six weeks, it's, in theory sounds easy, right? It's yep. like you hear about something and you start it, but there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts to it. How did it go from that car trip home from the pub after the girls had been to, to one of the classes to then bringing it to reality and, and opening Pen Picasso six weeks later? Very naively in hindsight. It, what you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. Um, and that's a wonderful thing to, to have at the time. Um, so we bluffed our way into a lease in, in Penrith. We said... Whereabouts in Penrith is the first? So it was on Castle Ray Street. Okay. So it's just off High Street. It's probably at the, the dodgier end. Um, it was this tiny little shop. We, we were going around for our first site inspections and we saw probably three at the time and we didn't like any. And then uh, the agent said, look, I can show you one more. The deal's pretty much done. Um, but I can, I can show you it. Like... You guys are, you know, upstarters. What's it hurt? Yeah. And it was just the one. Um, and then I kind of got the backstory as to who was uh, renting it at the time. And it was going to be a sublease. And I guess we just, from being in the area, knew actually Jake Warner. Um, he was able to kind of connect the dots for us. And we just said, look, we're ready to go. We can, whatever that offer is, we'll do a little bit better. Um, but if you're prepared to give us the keys, we're yours. We're no fuss after that. And that was it. Um and again, that's so naive. Um, and now any commercial lease that we do take is so calculated. Mm. It's looked at, it's scrutinized so many times. So yeah, it's, that, was, that was, I guess, the start of it. Then we uh, knew all the time that we weren't the people to execute this service. So we had to find what that person was. Um, and again, looking at, I guess, the success of it, it has been the best because it's not like we were opening a coffee shop where we effectively could be the baristas. Um, we knew that we weren't going to be able to fulfill the services. So we had to... You weren't a creative in school with the paintbrush? No, no, no. <laughs> and, I, and I also liked my weekends. So, um, yeah, we found, we found the, uh, someone with a great personality that was handy enough around with a paintbrush that enjoyed people. And, yeah, the rest is history. 
the 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 commercials behind a business right most people go into business and it sounds like you're commercially minded and have been from a young age um was there a business plan did you work out well this is how many how many customers we have to have per week to to hit our monthly you know rent and 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 all the other expenses that come with running a business or was it just like we'll open it up and hope people show up i think the first uh we were made to do that by by james's mum because she was lending us a little bit of money which we had to i guess pull apart the bones of the business or the potential business from the start but we looked at it and we said okay well rent is x we're both on full-time wages that can service that uh we're going to sign this for a year so are we prepared to lose why and we looked at it and said yes so Unfortunately for an investor, that wasn't like a strong enough um, business case. Business case, so we did have to pull it apart a little bit more and think, okay, what's our break even? What's our uh, risk mitigation? How's it actually going to work? Um, and we we actually sat in what is our current boardroom one Saturday um, and and doing that. And I was I was telling the story on the way in that if you knew kind of what we were looking at, we we're looking at like WHS protocols, and it was the most boring stuff ever. But um, now it's integral. Um, so well, thankfully we had, you know, good people around us, um, enough resources to kind of get this thing off the ground. So it, it sounds like you, you backed yourself and it may not have been calculated down to the, to the T, but you worked out that you had incomes from, from your jobs. It wasn't a, a business that you would have to give up your income for. Yeah. So the worst case scenario is you had a lease for 24, 36 months. It didn't work out and you still keep your job. Correct. And, and was there a uh, a vision to go okay well if this does work so the oper- opposite end of the spectrum within 12 months or 24 months we could be out of the job and and running the business no <laughs> not in the slightest right it was it was a let's see what happens okay completely let's see what happens uh let's have a gamble who knows what even even site two wasn't even a a thought a reality at the start it was let's see i think the the you're from the west jack so you understand um how painful it is coming to the city if you are from out that way um but it's been one of those things that we've always done Mm. so if people are prepared to travel to the city they're surely going to come to their own backyard and do it that was the mantra so with that let's see what happens see if the people arrive um we've got enough of a network to kind of get us off the ground and there was enough local PR and it was 2018, which was, I guess you'll look back and say that was, you know, some of the golden periods of startup businesses. Mm. Um, but again, you don't know what you don't know. So when did it start to become a reality that this thing may just be more than one, one store on, on Castle Race Street in Penrith? We were in Byron Bay. Um, we were looking at potentially going to Byron Bay for our second location and it was Christmas time and Christmas time 2018 really smacked us in the face because we had no idea how big and how well received this was going to be to um, for Christmas parties. So in Byron Bay, it was like the busiest night of the year at that time. Um, and we had a double booking. And I, I'll never forget, it. I've got the video on my phone where I'm watching an amazing busker on the side of on Johnson Street, you know, the classic Byron Bay scene, thinking, how good is this? And then you see that video and it just abruptly stops because I'd pick up a phone call and it was from my sister. And she said, uh, you've got a double booking here tonight. And the space that we had was, you know, tiny. Um, and, it, you know, there was 40 people in a 20-person max room. And these were both Christmas parties. So one person was going to go without their Christmas party. And... Our clientele is uh, females. So whether they're mothers, whether they've got so many commitments on their plate. So in order for that to come together, there's a lot of work that has to go into it. Babysitters. Correct. Make sure the Everything that go goes to the pub. Uh, Husbands, yeah. Husbands remembering that they have to do that sort of <laughs> stuff. So it was just a, it was a shit show after that. Um, trying to rummage around and get that corrected and also saying goodbye to... 20 people and and the ramifications that came with that so we looked at each other that night and said what are we doing like we have, we actually have something here that could be something really special we need to make the commitment here and and again what do we got to lose we were making really good money what do we got to lose for both of us to quit and have a genuine run at it mm. um and again that was that was just another kind of realization and then from that january 2019 we both finished up with our full-time jobs and and moved into Pinot full time, and we've been there ever since. And uh, from 2018 or the end of 2018 to to now, it's gone from one store in Castlereagh Street to, to how many? Around 80 in Australia and New Zealand. 
Have, yeah. you, have you had any more double booking since? I really <laughs> hope not. I know for any of our assets that we have, um, we had quite a few studios. We have not made that mistake since, but um, thankfully, you know, there's so many now around that we can just kind of move bookings to different locations, right. um, which is great. So the the, the one to, to 80, like there's a, a lot of growth both yep. personally and, and commercially yep. that has to happen to to achieve that. Like reflecting back on the last four years or five years of the journey, um, is there a moment where you, you, you're you sitting there and going, fuck, maybe I shouldn't have, maybe I shouldn't have thrown in the towel at the job and stayed at the job, but maybe this, this wasn't the best idea? I was thinking about this in the shower this morning when I... I am not feeling particularly well and, and just like coming into the city and having to, you know, do a little bit of media and, and everything like that. And sitting on the M4 as sitting well. Sitting on the M4 Fuck. and knew what we were kind of um, ab about to be in for. But I also thought like this, like at the time, I'm like, oh, I really don't want to head into the city. Yeah. But I also thought we're creating a life on our own terms. So irrespective of whether it's been easy, whether it's been tough, whether it's been you know, just all consuming. We're still on our, we're still in full control. Mm. So in regards to kind of going back, I, I, I came from London last, last month and you know, anyone that's been on a long haul flight, Sydney's so far away, but it probably comes a time where you're about two, three hours out from Sydney and you're done. You're absolutely done. And you almost just want to run up and down that plane and just, but you know, you can't go anywhere. And I liken that to still being working for the man. doesn't matter what you're doing, you're, you're still, you're done at potentially three o'clock and there's nothing you can do about that. So irrespective of all the tough times that business throws at you and the challenges and the lack of sleep and everything that happens, to be able to create it on your own terms is worth everything. Mm. So would you say that's the thing you, you enjoy most about business is not having to, to listen to the man, being able to have the creativity and flexibility to do what you want when you want? I think to an extent. Um, a friend of mine asked on Friday when I was on annual leave, you know, you could have every Friday as annual leave. And I said, I could, but what's the ramification on it? So whilst you can kind of do whatever you want, you still have responsibilities mm. that you can't neglect. So, um, but again, if you want to go on a flight to Melbourne on a Friday, you don't really need to ask anyone, which is a lovely, it's a lovely thought. Mm. And, and do you find when you are, like say when you're in London or, or you're away anywhere, do you find that business follows you, not necessarily physically, but mentally, like everywhere you go, you're still thinking about, Fuck, did I, I need to do this or I need to do that or I haven't you know, made the decision yet? Thankfully, we've got an amazing team that, that really do um, shoulder a lot of, uh, I guess, work that we are left to really high, high level decisions. Um, but with that being said, these decisions might take four months of thinking. Mm. Um, and that thought, I was reading Mark, like there's a thing I, well, that's been around forever is, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, how many weeks does he actually, uh, how many hours does he actually work in the business? It's like, you know, anywhere between 40 to 60. But in terms of me thinking about it, and that's not necessarily output, you're just using real estate in your, in your mind, it's endless. Unlimited, yeah. And do you, 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 you feel that? Absolutely. I was telling on the <laughs> way in, I I was so exhausted last night, but I wrestled crocodiles till for three hours just thinking about business. Like it's hard. It is. It, it's just the life that you're in, and you, and you choose it, right? That's the biggest thing. It's like if you didn't if you didn't want to do it, you can you can always go back and correct and get a job in corporate. Correct. What's uh, what's next? Like zero to, to eighty plus yep. stores in five years. Is yep. a Huge amount of growth. Yep. Um. What what's the next part of the journey look like? Consolidation. Um, we've built an amazing company here in Australia and New Zealand. So consolidating, giving our franchisees the opportunity to live an amazing life. Yeah. Um, that's at a homeland level. Um, and at an international level, it's getting the UK off the ground. They're two very clear directives um, and, and our team's fully committed to, to getting going. And what do you think the, the biggest challenge will be with an international market that you haven't entered before? The international market, I guess from our team perspective, is a tough one because... England and the in Europe is on completely different time frames to Australia. So whilst you get probably two hours, two genuine hours either side of your morning and afternoon mm. or night, should I say, you're on different frequencies. Um, where, you know, whatever the time is, we're all kind of experienced the same thing so far today. So we're not necessarily heaps more tired or heaps more energized. We're kind of at the same, at the same level. When you speak to your team in 
international. So true, isn't it? Yeah. You're on different frequencies, which does make things hard. And, and communication is a really tricky thing as well. But uh, we touched on that the culture of England being quite similar to Australia. I think they are so far away as well. Um, so just really understanding what the customer avatar of the English is. Um, we were only kind of able to pull apart our avatars after a year in business um, because you just see so many different types of people, walks of life. Mm. And I think the hardest part is making assumptions on experience, but it's also such a new experience as well. What do you think the, the biggest difference will be over there? I know Pommies love the Pierce, so that should be one tick of approval. Yeah, it, it's more just movement patterns. Um, you, you think... Be, it's freezing over there currently, but there's so many people outside. It's freezing in Australia. People are inside their homes, not <laughs> moving. So just understanding that things can go Monday to Sunday um, and it, the weather doesn't need to be good. The do weather doesn't need to be great. It can be God awful, but people will still lace up their boots and go outside, mm. which is crazy. So that, that should be a positive for business, right? Absolutely. But yeah. just kind of understanding the... What that, what that does to our service. Um, so therefore, England, we're playing in pounds. So we're also looking at commercial rents that are, let's just call it double when we play with pounds to Australian dollars. Right. So we've got to make these tough decisions whether these rents are actually going to be justified because there is a potential seven-day trade as opposed to in Australia we use about a four-day trade. Mm. And whether that seven-day trade could see three sessions a night so as opposed to you know 12 sessions a night. So all those decisions and... Um, we're going to get them wrong, but we might also get them very, very right. So just being prepared that it could go both ways. And and you obviously started the business in the western suburbs, not yep. necessarily in you know the CBD. Yep. Are you looking to do something similar in in the UK? Like, are you going to open up in London to begin with, or will you open up, you know, in a similar location but the UK version? Of yeah, Paris? great question. It, it, yes, we are going to open one in London to start. I think the the notion of having something in London is so much more appealing to every single person in England, knowing mm. that you have London. If you've been to London, it's, it's the biggest place on earth. Um, but also, yeah, introduce, uh, we call it like Metro Regional and Suburban um, or CBD Metro. So we're going to literally test what we know in Australia against uh, territories or regions in, regions the, UK. in, in the UK. And, uh, and hopefully it all pans out. Hopefully it all pans out. And Are you more or less concerned now because obviously when you started the business you had naivety yep. right so it was like yep. oh, whatever happens happens yep. now you've got more on the line yeah um, i'm sure it's going to be a big capital investment a big yep. time investment um are you are you more cautious and concerned now than what you would have been five years ago starting the business absolutely there's no ifs buts or maybes when we we could barely scrub a you know a couple of hundred dollars together back then and now you know we've got houses and cars and children and there's just a lot more at stake um but i don't think that should completely constrict the way that you think because there is more to lose effectively um I guess conversely there's a hell of a lot more to gain so yeah it's it's something that always crosses your mind but if mm. we got into this position because we were able to take the risk and and put ourselves um in a position so we need to do the same thing again and i'm sure there's a bit more of a business plan this time around huh? just a little bit more <laughs> thought process the there's probably been about 18 months worth of planning so <laughs> right. yeah it doesn't it doesn't just accidentally happen anymore amazing well to wrap up the podcast just like the uh the quote that i, that I mentioned at the start um we uh we asked each guest to let us know a quote that they live by uh, or that resonates most with them and that's the quote we then open up the uh the next podcast with so for yourself, what, what's a quote that you, uh, that you live by or a quote that when you hear you feel resonates or, or reflects your journey the most? Yeah, I, talking about teenage, Aaron, I always had this, it was this piece of paper that I had next to my bed that I wrote just randomly and a friend's father always used to say it to him and I thought that, and it was really successful. I thought that's just so profound because it's so simple, but it, it's, it was literally sticky tape to my tall boy next to my bed and I looked at it all the time and um until thinking and being prompted with that what's the quote I kind of suppressed it a little bit I hadn't really thought about it too much but I guess um kind of delving back a little bit more 
it really is something that I have lived by and, and, and have subscribed to. Um, and it's something so simple and almost a little cliche, but it's effort equals results. Results equal rewards. Rewards equals success. Simple as that. Effort equals results. And that was what he would always say to his children. Effort equals results. You can't expect everything if you're not prepared to do anything. It just doesn't happen. Mm. So it's going back, I guess, to the, the very, very first quote at not leaving something tomorrow that you wouldn't be prepared to die for. Mm. It's exactly the same thing that effort equals results. Like you, it, it, It's just such a no-brainer. And, and why do you feel like you said you've sort of sup- suppressed it or, or not... Um you know, not thought about it much since you, you sticky taped it on the side of the, the tour ball. Why do you reckon that is? Moved out of home. <laughs> and <it> didn't, <laughs> left, and the, it, left the tour <laughs> boy where it was. And it didn't, uh, it didn't follow me. I, I, I know my wife actually, she printed it nicely and it was on my desk. I need to find that. It's, you, you're bringing back a whole lot of cool memories that I had. Um, but suppressed, I'll probably maybe suppressed wasn't the right word where it just wasn't, physically front and in center. your face yeah, every yeah. single day so yeah that's what I, I i i've always subscribed to and i think the rewards part's really interesting mm. because it kind of i've always looked at it and i thought that doesn't actually fit like wouldn't results sorry success rewards come after success now they come all along the way it's kind of like what you do with them after that that the journey you. is the reward yeah correct amazing mate I thank you very much for uh, for taking the time out. You look look like you're sweating and a little bit sick as well. So, mate, it was a big journey. Yeah, I'm 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 gonna get uh, <laughs> a bit of water and our some marketing, sleep. I think. Yeah, our marketing to drive home. Our marketing girl to drive home. Mate, thank you very much for coming on. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jack.